This teaching that I'm going to share with you today is the most important teaching there is. Bottom line, end of story, this is what our faith is all about. I don't care how much you want to know. I don't care how much you think you know. I don't care how much you want to delve into the hidden mysteries of the Tanakh. This teaching today is the most important and critical teaching of our faith, period. And if we focused on nothing else, this should suffice. So what, what I want to talk to you about today is, having laid the groundwork, I want to talk to you today about why you need the Messiah. Why you need the Messiah. In Romans chapter 7, verse 14, Rav Shaul tells us that the Torah is spiritual. So brothers and sisters, if we consider ourselves to be spiritual, and by that I mean we have God's Spirit living inside of us, the complete Torah of Adonai should be an integral part of our spirituality. And we should consider all of it not just interesting or something that can be amazing. Brothers and sisters, the Torah should be relevant for our lives. In Shemot 25, verse 9, speaking of the Mishkin and its Kohanim, we read, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tent and the pattern of all its furniture, even so you shall make it. And in Ivram, Hebrews 8, 4, verse 4 through 5, it says, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the Torah, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Even as Moshe was warned by God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Why am I telling you that? Well, the purpose is this. We need to understand that everything we see in Scripture has a heavenly reality and a heavenly substance. And if we've come to the knowledge that we're part of the commonwealth of Israel in all its senses, as we find in Ephesians chapter 2, we should also understand that we're also part of Beit HaMashiach, the house of Messiah. And as such, we're called, brothers and sisters, to be a nation of priests in a spiritual sense. Kepha Aleph, 1 Peter 2, verse 5, tells us, You also, as living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah. And a little later in Kepha Aleph 2 verse 9, we read, But you're a chance race, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may show forth the ex excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So with this foundation established, we can see how the Torah that was given to the, to the Kohanim could be applicable to our own lives as we serve Hashem in the role of holy priests. And this is one of the ultimate goals of Adonai. This is what he's working towards with all of his people. Let me explain a bit further. In, in uh, Shemot chapter 28 Verses 36 and 37, we read, You shall make a frontlet of pure gold and engrave on it the seal inscription, Kadosh le Adonai, holy to the Lord. Suspend it on a cord of blue so that it may remain on the headdress. It shall remain on the front of the headdress. Here the Kohen Hagadol sets an example for a nation of Kohenim. Now, I want you to remember, as we started today, as I said, these things that I'm talking about are copies of heavenly realities. That being the case, the duties and the characteristics of the Kohen Hagadol are indicative of the Kohen Hagadol Hashemayim, speaking of the high priest of the heavenlies, after the order of Melchizedek. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about Yeshua the Messiah. In Shemot 28, verse 38, we read that this engraved frontlet is to be over Aaron's forehead 
because Aaron bears the guilt for any errors committed by the people of Israel in consecrating their holy gifts. This ornament is always to be on his forehead so that the gifts for Hashem will be accepted by him. See, I'm, what I'm trying to show you is that in a similar heavenly manner, our Kohen Haggadol, because of his personal holiness to Adonai, he's able to bear the guilt of any errors that his people have committed. As we read earlier in Shemot, it says he shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment on his heart. When he goes into the holy place for a memorial before Hashem continually. The Kohen here acts as an intercessor for the children of Israel and pleads their case and seeks mercy and grace on their behalf. The Kohen Haggadot Shemaim, the high priest of heaven, he does exactly the same thing, brothers and sisters. In Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34, it confirms as we read, So who will bring a charge against God's chosen people? Certainly not God. He's the one who causes them to be considered righteous. Who punishes them? Certainly not Messiah Yeshua, who died and more than that has been raised and is at the right hand of God and is actually pleading on our behalf. But you see, brothers and sisters, both of these Kohanim, whether it's the earthly or the heavenly, what I want you to understand today is they only intercede on behalf of those sincere in repentance and those who sincerely seek to live after their example. Kadosh la Adonai, holiness to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you today, Adonai does not accept insincere repentance. And if we're to be a nation of holy priests, we must live after the example of our Kohen Hagadol, Yeshua. But you might be asking yourself, and you might even ask me, well, Josh, what does sincere, sincere repentance look like? Sincere repentance and a right standing with God lead to holy living. Ivram 12, 14 says, Pursue shalom with every man and after holiness, without which no one will see Adonai. The brothers and sisters, I want us to stop today. And I want us to realize, however much we think we might know, however holy we might think we are, Brothers and sisters, there is a true reality that this issue of holiness is very important to God's overall plan. You see, his goal is that his people would be made entirely. Every single one of us would be made into a holy nation of Kohanim. That's why we see in Zechariah 14 verses 20 and 21, it gives us the following description. It says, In that day there will be on the bells of the horses, Kadosh la Adonai, holy to the Lord. And the pots in Hashem's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Yerushalayim and in Yehuda will be holy to Hashem of armies. And all those who sacrifice will come and take of them and cook in them. In that day, there will no longer be a Kanani, a merchants, in the house of Hashem of armies. See, the point being made here is that in the coming kingdom of Messiah, the goal will be accomplished. Everything and everybody will finally be holy to Adonai. And it won't matter if it's the horses, the bowls before the altar of God, or the cooking pots in all of Yerushalayim. Everybody and everything will be set apart to Adonai. No one in Adonai's house will be characterized by unholiness. And that's why we're encouraged in the book of Hebrews to follow after holiness, without which none will see Adonai. 
You see, I'm not telling you today, brothers and sisters, that you should take a stance of having a holier-than-thou type of attitude. Personally, I'm sick of it. Instead, what I'm asking you to do today is to adopt a holy-like-Yeshua attitude. Because if we don't do that, brothers and sisters, not a single one of us will see the Lord. And I believe we really need to meditate on these things and not take them lightly. And I think, brothers and sisters, we are guilty of taking these things lightly. So, Josh, you said you were going to talk about why we need Messiah. How does all of this connect with why I need Messiah? Well, without Messiah, brothers and sisters, we all know that no one can truly be Kadosh La'adonai. And this is essentially the message of the kingdom of God and the beginning of the message of the Besarat Tovat. But regrettably, brothers and sisters, many people have either not heard the message because they've never truly sought yod heh vav and his kingdom, or they've received a counterfeit and a false message, a false version of the good news. Yeah, but it sounded good. Yeah, but he's got this massive following. He's got this massive church. He's got this massive, massive, even messianic following. Brothers and sisters, even these people can give you a counterfeit and a false message. Why is it all of these people that you hold so dear? Why is it in every single one of their posts on Facebook, Instagram, wherever they post? Why, do, why is it that every single one of them says, don't forget to donate? Don't forget to plant your seed or sow your seed into my ministry. Why does every single one of them, even messianics, why do they do it? Because they're preaching a false message. They're giving you a counterfeit gospel. The gospels actually say, do you know what the scripture actually says? Ask no man for anything. Your creator can provide for you. As I've often said, if it is God ordained, it will be God sustained. You don't have to ask. And brothers and sisters, even in our own little ministry here, I want to say to you, I've never asked anybody for anything, not one dime. But do you know what? People out of the goodness of their heart and because the Holy Spirit moves them, they have they have continued to bless us over and over and over again. And we have never been unable to pay for meeting in the hall. I've never been unable to pay for anything that it costs to be able to do this. Why? Why? Because I'm leaving it to God. I'm leaving it to him to move the hearts of people. I'm not trying to teach you a counterfeit gospel. I'm not trying to teach you a false message. So for that reason, brothers and sisters, I want us to use the next part of this message as a spiritual checkup today. Even those of you who believe you're born again, I want you to use this as your spiritual checkup. For some of you, it might give you some clarification. For other people, it might help you receive the good news of the kingdom for the very first time. This, brothers and sisters, is why I do what I do. I'm not here to, to tickle your ears. I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear. I'm not here to try to give you the hidden mysteries of all things. I'm here to preach the good news of our Messiah, Yeshua. And some weeks it will take a form of one thing, and some weeks it will take the form of something else. You see, I'm aware that some people have rejected what's been called the good news, or some might even call it the gospel. Because brothers and sisters, what they've been taught is actually not good news at all. And it's not according to the full counsel of God. And this is because so many false gospels have gone out into the world. I even heard that. I heard, listen, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I listened to a priest this week, giving a little, just a little part of his, his talk this week. Brothers and sisters, I was nauseated. I was nauseated because he didn't teach any truth of the gospel. All he did was tickle ears and use some buzzwords that people found, wow, that's really encouraging, and it gave them a boost. 
It's a false gospel. It's a false gospel. So you might already identify yourself as a believer. You may not. I don't know. Whatever the case, though, I'm going to ask you today, please take a moment to hear me out. Because what I want to try to pull out today is what Hashem has really communicated to mankind about our quest to become holy. You see, there are some people that believe that all roads lead to God. Many believe as long as they're basically good and they don't cause any major harm, then they'll qualify for whatever reward they're going to get in the Akarit Hamayim in the end of days. But my friend, if that's what you've been taught, I want to say to you today, not to discourage you, but the Bible tells us something that is completely different if we'll read it. You see, brothers and sisters, whether you claim to be born again or whether you don't know God at all, you need to understand that we serve a very particular God with a very particular set of instructions for life and instructions on how to obtain eternal life in the Olam Haba, the world to come. And despite what someone might have taught you about, we've got the right religion, we've got the true religion, Mormonism is the way, fundamental Baptist is the only way, whatever people might have taught you, Islam is the only way. These instructions for for obtaining eternal life, brothers and sisters, they don't belong to any one group of people. They're for every man. They're for every woman. They're for every child to hear and apply to their lives. Now, you may not know me. You may have never heard of me before. Who is Josh Mason? Some guy from North Carolina. Who the heck is that? So you might be saying, why on earth should I listen to you? What about these other types of faith? This, the, the Islam tells me Islam's the way. Buddhism tells me that that's the way. What about these other forms of faith? Well, let me explain to you, brothers and sisters. Other than the Messianic faith, which is what I practice, no other religion or faith assures the person of complete and guaranteed forgiveness and salvation. Not one. Not one. I've looked. Ask Steve. He's looked. Not one of them does that for you. You see, people need Messiah Yeshua for a multitude of reasons. But I want to briefly focus on four urgent reasons that I believe you need Yeshua the Messiah today. These four reasons are this. Number one is sin. Number two is judgment. Number three is forgiveness that leads to freedom and salvation. And number four is empowerment. So let's talk about sin. We've all done it, right? Will we admit that we've all done it? Well, some of you might not. And if you don't believe me, let's let's just measure just how right you are. If you've ever acted wrongly against your parents or elders in any way, according to God's standards, you've been disrespectful. You've sinned. If you've ever told a lie, even a white lie, according to God's standards, you're a liar. That's sin. If you've ever used God's name in vain, not just by the words that you've said, but how you've lived while claiming his salvation, then according to God's standards, you're a blasphemer sin. If you've ever taken anything that doesn't belong to you, according to God's standards, you're a thief. Sin. If you've ever participated in malicious gossip, something we know in Hebrew as Lashon Hara, according to God's standards, you're a backstabber, which could be equated with personality assassination sin. 
If you've ever looked at a man or a woman with lust, Yeshua said you're guilty of adultery. Sin. You see, there are many more sins that you could and probably do commit. But if any of these things I've just listed describes you, you know, there's a game where you're supposed to put your hands up and for everything somebody says, you put one finger down if you've done that. If you'd have no fingers left, brothers and sisters, this morning, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Because if any of these things describe you, you could be described as a disrespectful, lying, blaspheming, thieving, backstabbing, murderous adulterer. In other words, my friends, you might not be as good as you'd like to think you are. In the Ketave Shelachim, the apostolic writings, it gives us the definition of sin so that we can fully identify the sins we've committed. Yochanan Aleph 3 verse 4 says, Everyone who keeps sinning is violating Torah. Indeed, sin is violation of Torah. This verse is, of course, talking about God's Torah, His law. So, brothers and sisters and my friends out there, listen. All you need to do is read through the first five books of the Bible. And this is why a lot of people don't want to do it, because it makes you guilty. Just read through the first five books of the Bible and read about the laws of God and determine which ones you've broken. It's that simple. That's how you can identify how you've sinned and how you might still be sinning in your life. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. That's pretty harsh. You see what Paul is actually saying here. He's saying that if you're human... You have a sin problem. You have a sin problem on your hands. The question I want to ask you today, my friend, if you've never received this good news is, can you deal with this sin properly by yourself? Let's talk about judgment a minute. Why is this a big deal? Why is judgment a big deal? It's important to realize that we're sinners because if this is the case then we're in need of forgiveness for the transgressions that we've committed. If God exists and he is truly a righteous God, then the undeniable fact, my friend, is that God, because he has no other choice, he must judge our sin. But my friends, you cannot make up for your sins simply by doing good works or claiming that I'm a good person. It doesn't work that way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works that no one would boast. You see, the harsh reality is for those who don't have their sins forgiven, they're going to experience death in this world and also in the world to come. It's something that the Bible refers to as the second death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For what one earns from sin is death, but eternal life is what one receives as a free gift from God in union with the Messiah Yeshua our Lord. Unless someone wants to experience a spiritual death and eternal damnation, they need the gift of God given through Yeshua, the Messiah, which leads to eternal life. My friends, I want to say to you today, these aren't things you want to gamble with. These are not things that you want to gamble with. If you claim to believe that there's no God, then I want to say you better be absolutely sure that he doesn't exist. 
absolutely sure that he doesn't exist. Because if there's even the slightest chance that you're wrong, you're putting yourself at an eternal risk. And if you say, brothers and sisters, oh, I've received the good news. I've received salvation through Messiah Yeshua, but you don't really believe it in your heart. Let me tell you, your life will reflect what's really in your heart. Brothers and sisters, can I admit something to you today? I can see some of you and I can see some of the things that you can do. And it's telling me exactly what's in your heart. Exactly what's in your heart. These are not things we want to gamble with, brothers and sisters. If these things, anything that I've said thus far, describes who you are today, I want to encourage you today. It is time to get right with your Creator. Ephraim 9 verse 22 tells us that there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood and without sacrifice. It says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. See, even though sacrifices are no longer performed in the Beit HaMikdash, because we don't have an earthly temple at the moment, there is still a need for blood sacrifice for the remission of sins. You see, previously animal sacrifices performed in the prescribed manner simply cleanse the outward man. But these sacrifices couldn't deal with the root of the problem. Well, what is that, Josh? It's our wicked nature. You see, only a perfect sacrifice from a perfect lamb, one at least on the same level of humanity, could atone for humanity and their sins. And only this perfect sacrifice could actually deal with the root of our wickedness so that sin could permanently be put into remission. My friends, I don't know you. Some of you who are listening, I may not know you. And you may be hearing this type of message for the first time, but I want you to know that sin is like a cancer. And those of us who have been in the faith for a while, we know this is true. Because sin can come back and it can kill someone. But I've got good news. I'm not going to leave you there. Yeshua is the cure for our spiritual cancer and this eternal death. Only Yeshua can cause us to have a full recovery, and he'll put sin into full remission for those who are wholeheartedly putting their trust in the perfect blood of his sacrifice, which Scripture tells us was acceptable in God's eyes to pay the sin debt that you and I owed. Do you believe this? Have you actually, have you actually accepted his sacrificial blood on your behalf? Have you forgotten? Maybe you, maybe it was 20 years ago. Maybe it was 35 years ago. Have you forgotten that moment? Have you forgotten when that weight was lifted? Brothers and sisters, accepting the sacrificial blood of our Messiah Yeshua is something that we should renew and commit to every single day. You know, I've often, over the past 47 years of my life, there have been times when Satan has come to me or the enemy has come to me and he said, yeah, but did you really, did you really accept it? Did you really believe in Yeshua? Do you really believe in all this stuff? you know what my response is? Maybe you're right. So if you are, I'll do it right now. And brothers and sisters, I continually renew this commitment every single day that my feet hit the floor. I say, Father, today I choose you. I choose that blood that was sacrificed for me. This is why, brothers and sisters, that Paul relates to us that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is what he's talking about. Working out your salvation is a daily motivated thing. It's daily putting your feet on the floor and saying, today I choose the blood of my Messiah to cover my wicked sin. 
problem is, do we really believe it? You see, those who don't experience this remission of sin, they're going to suffer its ultimate effects. And these people, they will be judged and they will be condemned. People in the future, I want to tell you today, if you've not accepted the Messiah as your sacrifice, you're going to be caught up in the worst storm that the world has ever seen. And there's going to be nowhere to hide. There's going to be nowhere to run. That's why Yeshua the Messiah taught the following in Matthew 25, verses 41 and also verse 46, about those who will be condemned by God in the end of time. He said, then, they shall say, then, then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. My friend, can I tell you something today? Can I encourage you with something today? Do you understand? Do you realize that hell was never meant for you? Do you realize that the creation of hell was never meant for a single human being to ever be there? Hell was created for the devil. Hell was created for the devil's angels. It was never created for humanity. Do you know why? Because the will of our Father is that every single person that has ever been born on this planet would receive the good news of the Messiah, Yeshua, and become part of the kingdom of heaven. That is what he wants for you today. He's giving you that chance. But brothers and sisters, those of us who claim that we've received this good news, Often we can become bold, overbold in what it is that we believe. You know, I said a few weeks ago, we talked about a verse in Matthew where Yeshua says, the one who teaches and does the Torah will be the greatest in the kingdom. The one who doesn't teach and doesn't do will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And I've said to you, does a person have to do Torah? No, not officially, not to get into the kingdom. But there's a caveat to that verse. There is a caveat to that verse, and I want to I explain this to you in the best way that I possibly can, and this is kind of what God has been saying to me over the past couple of weeks. He says, while it's true that there are those there who will be part of the kingdom that will be the least because they didn't keep Torah and they didn't teach Torah, what he said to me is, Josh, do you understand it's because of their ignorance? It's because of their ignorance. They never knew. Because of the teachings of the world, because of the teachings of men throughout the generations, these people never knew that they should keep Torah. These people never knew that they should teach Torah. So brothers and sisters, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because there's something that's serious that we need to understand today. Those of us who claim that we've received this salvation, we've received this so we don't have to worry about anything. And that that whole obeying the Torah, well, look, even people who don't obey it are there. Yeah, but those people are un, they're unknowing. They're ignorant. We here today, brothers and sisters, those of us who are sat here in this Zoom meeting, none of us are ignorant of the truth. And by sitting here today, you're making yourself culpable. You're you're you're, you're making yourself guilty. You're making yourself put into a place of saying, Father, I know what I should be doing. This is where things get hard, brothers and sisters, because Ivram chapter 10, verses 26 and 27 talks to us. It talks to us who say, you know what? I've received the good news of the Messiah. I know what I should be doing. I know I should be keeping Shabbat. I know I should be observing the Moedim. I know I should be putting others before myself. Ivram chapter 10, verses 26 and 27 says, for if we deliberately continue to sin... Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Wake up just a minute. If we deliberately continue to sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth, which is exactly what I'm sharing with you today, brothers and sisters, those of us who have claimed the Messiah, if you could continue to deliberately sin, there is no longer a sacrifice for sins. 
Do you know what it prescribes for us who claim that we know? It prescribes this, but only the terrifying prospect of judgment, of raging fire that will consume the enemies. You see, I'm not just talking to the people who don't know better today. I'm not talking to the people that have never received Yeshua the Messiah as their salvation today. Brothers and sisters, I'm also talking to us. We who have claimed that we've received, yet we continue to willfully sin. We willfully. See, that's the difference in Matthew. What Yeshua didn't say, he didn't say those who are willfully not teaching the Torah, those who are willfully not obeying the Torah. He didn't talk about them. You see, if you willfully ignore, if you willfully walk away, if you willfully make the decision, you've made your choice about who your God is. You've said, my God is me. I'll be responsible for my salvation. I don't need that sacrifice. That's what willful sin does, brothers and sisters. That's exactly what you're saying to the Creator. I no longer need your sacrifice because I have my own way. I'm going to do what I want to do because I run this show, not you. Brothers and sisters, the weight of responsibility on our shoulders is much greater than you think it is. And we need to stop lying to people. Pastors, stop lying to your congregation, telling them that there's no responsibility when you're saved. You are lying to your congregations and leading them to the pit of hell. Let's talk about another reason you need the Messiah today. Forgiveness that leads to freedom and salvation. Tehillim 130 verse 4 says, But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Everything I've just been talking to you about, brothers and sisters, you should understand there is a very good reason that you should fear God. In the Bible, Ephraim 10.31 tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Brothers and sisters, my friends out there, if you've not been forgiven of your sins, you'll want to be. You will most definitely want to be, but you can only do it now. You can't do it when you're in the grave. The only way that you can receive that forgiveness of sin is right Now, on this earth, while you're still breathing, you don't know that you'll take another breath. Why are you gambling with your eternity? Speaking of Yeshua the Messiah, the book of Acts, it tells us, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And Yeshua, he speaks about himself in the following way. He says, the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Comes from Matthew chapter 9, verse 6. See, Yeshua is the one and only Son of God coming directly from God. And Yeshua, Yeshua is a manifestation of the God of the universe in a human form. That being the case, God is satisfied to give Yeshua, through his sacrifice, the authority to grant forgiveness based on his merit, which is perfect. Yohanan 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only and unique Son, so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life, instead of being utterly destroyed. You see, even if you've committed the most terrible sins, He'll forgive you if you're sincere in turning from your unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 says, Or do you not know that unjust ones will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be led astray, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous ones, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor plunderers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you were those things, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua and in the spirit of our God. You see, we need to understand and we need to start being honest with people. 
The reality, brothers and sisters, is that there will be no homosexuals in the kingdom of God. I don't care what a homosexual priest tells you. There will be no prostitutes in the kingdom of God. I don't care what someone might tell you. There's not going to be any thieves in the kingdom of God. But why? I thought God accepts everyone and he brings everybody into his kingdom. Brothers and sisters, it's because when he saves you, he changes who you are. And if you claim that you've received the salvation of Messiah Yeshua, but you've not received a change then you've not received the salvation of Messiah Yeshua. He will change you. You will no longer be who you are. You cannot be a homosexual Christian because it it completely is contrary to what the Bible actually says. If you were a homosexual and you received the salvation of Messiah Yeshua, he will change you. He will change who you are. He will change that, that desire inside of you. He will give you a new heart. We just don't believe it. We just don't believe it. We don't believe he can. I'm here today to tell you he can. He can change you. In the book of Ivram 7, verses 24 and 25, it says the following about Yeshua. But he, because he lives forever, has his priesthood unchangeable. His priesthood is unchangeable. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, seeing that he lives forever. He lives forever to make intercession for them. If you haven't asked for forgiveness of your sins and you haven't endeavored to turn from a life of sin and you haven't accepted Yeshua the Messiah's sacrifice on your behalf, I want to let you know you can do it today. You can be assured of your salvation and forgiveness. And you can know today, right where you sit, that your sins have been forgiven. And it's not complicated. I'm not going to try to complicate it. All you have to do, my friend, is say, just believe in the good news. Believe in the good news that I'm sharing with you and simply ask God, ask your creator now in Yeshua's name to forgive you of your sins, of breaking his laws, of breaking his Torah and ask him to lead you in his way. If you do this, I promise you, I promise you he is faithful to forgive you of all your sins. Yochanan Aleph, 1 verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, we need to reaffirm. And in some cases, we need to confirm this for the very first time. We need to do this in our hearts today. Yeshua is our only hope. In fact, for those who don't know Yeshua himself, his name means salvation, or more literally, it means he shall save. This man that I'm talking about, he is the salvation and the deliverance provided by the creator himself. Why would you come to him today? If you claim it already, why don't you believe it anymore? Why are you not living like it anymore? Why do you need Messiah? Empowerment. Once you've trusted in Yeshua and his sacrifice on your behalf, and you've asked God to forgive you of your sins, there's something that is miraculous that happens. He not only forgives you of your sins, but he also empowers you to live a life of righteousness according to his ways. The Greek word for grace spoken of in the New Covenant or Renewed Covenant scriptures is the word charis. This grace is an active favor. Many times this word is translated as a gift And it can also be understood as an endowment or an enablement. 
And this is the context which I believe the word grace should be understood, as it's different from the word mercy. Sometimes we get those two mixed up. You see, Adonai grants us mercy so that he can give us his grace to overcome and to enable us to live a holy life according to his Torah. This is the gift of the Brit Hadashah. Once you've accepted this gift, it's essential to understand that you've not been saved to live a life as you please. He's not saving you from sin so that you can live however you want to live. He's trying to save you from sin so that you can live how he pleases. You see, previously you were a slave to sin, but now you're a slave to righteousness. As Steve so wisely put it several months ago, I remember him saying this, and it's always stuck with me. He came to a point where he realized one of the great moments of his life was that he realized you're, a, you're always a slave. It's just choosing which one you're going to be a slave to. You can be a slave to sin or you can be a slave to righteousness, brothers and sisters. This is the promise of the renewed covenant. And even though this promise is spoken of in the Ketave Shelachim, the apostolic writings, and spoken of in Ivram 10.16, this promise that I'm talking to you about, it was first spoken of by the prophets of old. In Yermiyahu 31, verses 32 to 34, it says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Sidebar, he doesn't say church, he doesn't say Whatever. He doesn't say any other group of people. He says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said Hashem. I will put my Torah within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will any of them teach his fellow community member or his brother. No, Hashem, for all will know me from the least of them to the greatest, because I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So we'll be empowered to live by his ways because through his spirit, he'll inscribe his Torah, his law and his ways on our hearts so that we'll have a heart to do the things that are righteous and holy in his eyes. This was the very purpose of Yeshua himself. This is why he was manifested in the flesh. In Yochanan Aleph 3, 7 through 8, it says, Little children, let no one lead you astray. He who does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He who sins is of Hasatan, for Hasatan has been sinning from the beginning. To this end, the Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the works of Hasatan. The context of this passage is that Messiah came to destroy the works of the devil, sin, in us. He actually came to get us to stop sinning so that we'd be living holy lives. It wasn't God's law or God's tour that needed to be changed. It was and it is our hearts that need to be changed. And this is one of the primary purposes of the renewed covenant that he's given us. Not only does this covenant provide forgiveness of sins, but it's a fresh start with the empowerment to live holy lives. We see the prophet Ezekiel also speaks of this Brit Hadashah. In Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, we read, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit inside you. I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit inside you and cause you to live by my laws, respect my rulings, and obey them. You see, each new covenant that God has added, it complements and it builds on the covenants that he gave previously. And this covenant was given for forgiveness of sins and to empower the person to live a life of holiness to God. 
Yeshua, the salvation of Israel, inaugurated this renewed covenant with his sacrifice and his blood that was shed for this purpose. In Matthew 26, verses 27 to 28, it says about Yeshua, And taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink all of it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which which concerning many is being poured out for the remissions of sins. See, although the disciples didn't literally drink his blood, as some people teach, they had to, in a very intimate way, accept the blood of his sacrifice for their innermost being. This is what I was talking to you about. The problem that we have is our hearts. They had to accept the yoke of the master's life upon and throughout their life. To accept his sacrifice, they had to understand it. In Jewish thought, one of the things wine or the blood of the grape symbolized was teaching. So they have to trust and believe that what Yeshua was teaching them They had to believe these things in order to enter into the renewed covenant. See, once we believed his message, we're empowered to take that message and effectively apply it to our lives. Yeshua said the following in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, And behold, I send forth the promise of my Father to you, but you sit in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. And in Yochanan 16, 13, he goes on to say the following about the Ruach HaKodesh. But when that one comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will announce the coming things to you. This, my friends, is why you need Yeshua the Messiah. Through Yeshua the Messiah, you can escape the judgment coming on this earth and in the world to come, that second death that I was talking about. You can know right now that you're in good standing with your Creator, that your sins have been forgiven, and that you are truly kadosh la'adonai, holy to Adonai. Despite what other men and religion may tell you, the good news is simple. Believe. Repent with the full intent of living wholly according to Adonai's instructions. And accept forgiveness, mercy, grace, and empowerment that Adonai wants to give you. For those of you who haven't already begun this journey, don't waste time. You don't know if you have another breath. Don't waste time. You can begin this most exciting and rewarding journey of your life today. And for those of us, maybe become a little bit complacent. Or we've become distracted in our faith. Maybe we've become distracted in our obedience. Brothers and sisters, it's time to recommit yourself to the pursuit of Adonai's holiness. Baruch Hashem, Adonai.